Sounds good. Go for it. Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, extraction and land use in physics. So uh, my name is Serene, as Joan mentioned, and I'm a recent uh, UW graduate from a BSc in physics and astronomy. And I am starting um, my master's in science education at UBC this fall. Um, I've also done a couple of research positions in my undergrad uh, at the University of Waterloo, which was in physics education, at Triumph, which was in gamma ray spectroscopy, and at the PGCRL, which is at Sick Kids in biophysics. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, so the author of our article today is Emma McKay. She is also a fellow alum. Oh, they are a fellow alum at the undergrad uh, at UW. Um, they are also a co-founder of FemFIS um, and a huge advocate for quantum ethics. Uh, they are currently doing their PhD at McGill um, and are very active uh, for quantum ethics. So feel free to follow their Twitter at Electro Week. Um, yeah. So a brief chime in on Emma yeah. McKay. When I first arrived at the IQC, it was because of Emma McKay's vocal advocacy for quantum ethics that the idea or the concept was really planted for me that these issues might uh, be important to discuss in this field. And they were one of the first people when I was founding the quantum ethics project that I came to who provided me with valuable advice, readings, and a couple of other introductions for people to talk to. So they and their ideas and their advocacy have played a huge role in quantum ethics becoming a field here in Waterloo. So they're a very important uh, thinker in the space. Yeah, I'm very excited to uh, present their article and the information that they have provided for us, um, which is really exciting. So um, there are many resources in our daily lives, um, metals that we may or may not be aware of, uh, such as lithium ion batteries in our smartphones or indium in our LCD screens. Um, and since we're here for quantum computing and quantum ethics, um, there is also a variety of metals that I will touch on but specifically indium in uh, superconducting uh, circuits for quantum computing. Um, so uh, even though many of us may know or may not uh, about these uh, materials, I don't think we think about, uh, much about where they come from. They usually are magically presented to us at the store in a variety of forms at our disposal. And especially uh, with the realities behind extracting these materials, I think it's really important that we're having this conversation today um, to bring it to light. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, quantum computing uses a lot of uh, these metals, and we have been here for the last uh, several weeks talking about quantum ethics um, and worrying about the future of quantum computing and if it'll be ethical or not. Um, however, uh, quantum computing is already taken a very unethical journey um, in its use of metals and materials and resources. Um, so uh, I'm here today to present the article that helps us understand the chain of supplies of metals and resources and also maybe helps us um, to talk more about requiring research and technology to use ethically sourced materials and what, what this might look like. So um, all of this starts with capitalist colonial extraction. Um, and this deals with cutting down trees um, uh, and prop often without proper reforestation, uh, digging indium, uh, once again, a big mining process, um, and as a result, leaving toxic traces that inhibit ecosystems from thriving. So capital colonial extraction is not a great thing. People come in and take land and exploit the workers that are there. Um, and so uh, the metals that come out from this process are most commonly known as conflict metals. So where do they all come from? Um, mining. Mining is the first, uh, the main source of metals. Um, it is incredibly dangerous. Um, and our main focus today will come from a dangerously close to collapsing mountain, Chera Rico in Bolivia, which is also known as the mountain that eats men. So as you can see, it's not somewhere I would like to be. It looks very scary. And a lot of um, indigenous workers of Bolivia are exploited 
um, for their time and not very not given a lot of money to um, to do this. Um, and it is so all of these metals and resources are coming at a big human cost. Um, and there are better ways to do this um, as, for example, labor unions or fair trade or suppliers that have safer working conditions and better rights. However, this is currently not the process that is taking place to acquire the metals that we are using now um, and uh, in quantum computing. So step one in doing our part is understanding a possible supply chain of metals, which Emma helps us with um, in this article. Um, and it's just uh, a possible supply chain, which I will explain later. Um, so it starts with the mines, as I um, mentioned, uh, where workers are not given proper compensation, they are in risk of losing their lives, um, and generations of trauma since the 19th century, um, since they started exploitation uh, of the indigenous peoples. Um, so it's really concerning and alarming that there's no awareness for basic human rights of indigenous peoples and there are no protective rights for them. Um, on top of this, they are not given proper compensation um, because they have no idea that indium is present in the ore that they are selling. So they're getting undervalued, um, they get less money. Um, and that's essentially where this um, origin of indium starts. Um, following this, uh, it goes to the smelters. So one of the examples is Tech Resources, which is located in Trail, BC, um, not so far from where I am today. And they refine the metals, get what they actually want, um, and further sell it to other companies, which are possibilities of Indium Corporation or Sigma Aldridge. We're not quite sure. Um, of this supply chain um, uh, due to uh, no legal obligations to disclose this information um, from these corporations. They don't have um, any obligations to tell us where they are buying um, or getting this these metals from. So their supplier information is completely unknown. Um, and then this ends up in our labs today. So um, this is a possible supply chain. We aren't like 100% confident in it, um, but it gives us an idea that, you know, there are a lot of middlemen um, and it all starts with exploitations um, in the mines. So as a personal experience, as I mentioned, I worked at Triumph, um, and so I was doing a co-op um, in gamma ray spectroscopy. Um, during my time there, I worked with uh, several metals and resources, a couple listed here. Um, one of the most important is uh, liquid helium, um, uh, which I will talk about a little more um, in the future. Um, and so during my time there, uh, when I was just... Um, reminiscing, I realized that I never really asked a question of where all of these materials or metals came from. Um, and so that's really concerning that it's not really a conversation that is being had. Um, but as researchers, we have the power to make a difference. Uh, we are pur purchasing these materials um, and we can decide whether or whether or not we can uh, we want to buy from certain suppliers or not. So um, this is something that we should think about as we do use these metals more than the average consumer. Um, and so we possibly can make a difference. So um, the use of uh, materials in the lab currently um, is rather low, but um, as quantum computing comes out or like when something goes to mass production for commercial scale, uh, we are unable to control the overuse of these metals and materials. Um, so as I was mentioning, quantum computing uses indium and liquid helium. I know a lot of us here, like helium is so abundant, we know it's it's so abundant in the universe. However, on Earth for us, it is a limited resource and is very rare for us. Um, and there are other materials as well, such as gallium, uh, silicon, aluminum, copper, that are all used in quantum computing um, that when brought to this mass production, we really don't have any idea of how long we have before we run out of all of these resources. 
So like I was mentioning, we don't even know where the materials truly come from. Uh, there's a bunch of middlemen and um, there's undisclosed supplier information. And as researchers, we want to make a difference and, and help. But if we don't even have this information, um, it's it's it, it's very tough. So now what? Uh, do we stop research? Um, and the author, Emma McKay, she, they believe so, um, that this is a possible um, solution. Um, uh, as I mentioned, this goes way beyond quantum computing. There are uh, other branches of physics that are using uh, metals and resources that will go, um, you know, way beyond us. And in this case, um, if we have no idea where they are coming from, uh, colonial cor corporations could put in regulations. Um, so this would deal with um, traceable supply chains, letting us know where they are truly getting these metals from, um, organic labels, letting us know it's ethically sourced, um, and really being open about the fact that these are non-renewable resources. Once we run out, we run out and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, so that would help us as researchers to know that we are uh, ethically sourcing our materials. And then are there uh, equitable and ethical ways of acquiring metals and resources for the time being, um, as opposed to uh, just waiting for, you know, um, uh, all of this information, um, or can we use metals that we know for sure are, you know, locally sourced um, and are ethical and equitable? Um, and as I mentioned, and to just really drive the point home, we are worried about quantum computing in the future. However, there is an unethical journey that is currently taking place and something that we should really uh, be concerned about and thinking about and uh, having conversations about. So thank you. That was a fantastic uh, talk, Serene. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, could you go back to that last slide? We maybe can leave that up because there's a For lot sure. of nice discussion points that you've brought up here. Like the question being, you know, what do we do about this as researchers? It's still recording. Do you want to stop the recording question? Thank you, Indy. I appreciate the reminder. So as Indy pointed out, I'm now going to stop the recording uh, so that we can all just